And I'm Robin Jefferson Higgins. I am in a former life, I practice law. I'm happy to be here today. So what I'm gonna do is talk about United States Supreme Court's um, decision or lack thereof decision when it comes to book banning, um, dealing with the First Amendment. So I'm hoping that after I do my talk, you will understand why really the floodgates have opened regarding this because of the United States Supreme Court case. So we know book banning is back with a bang, right? So according to the American Library Association, from September to December of just 2001, there have been more than 470 book removal requests. And so, of course, most of these books address voices of lived experiences of the indigenous um, people, black and brown people, um, people, um, LGBTQIA individuals. Um, and so it's very interesting that this has been um, targeted on some of these marginalized groups. And so, of course, there are some exceptions. For example, there is the book, um, Mausa. It's the graphic novel about the Holocaust, but still, that could be an issue regarding those individuals who are Holocaust deniers. So, for example, last October, an all-white school board in York, school board in York, PA, or Pennsylvania, they unanimously banned a list of educational resource, resources that actually include a book about Rosa Parks' refusal to give up her seat to a white passenger of a bus. And also the book, I Am Malala, and her struggle to give girls or have girls educated in Pakistan. So therefore, many of the book bans center around books that discuss race, uh, social justice, and gender. And so in my talk, I'm going to discuss whether the efforts of book banning runs afoul of the First Amendment of the United States Constitution, or does this effort fall within the school board's discretion? All right, so let's um, take a look at uh, what's going on here. And so to begin this discussion, we must go back about 41 years and take a look at the landmark case regarding school censorship. And so the name of this case is Island Trees Union Free School District versus PICA. Um, the case was decided in 1989. And so this happens to be the first and the only time that the United States Supreme Court considered the question of book removal from school libraries. So even though the United States Supreme Court ruled in favor of the students of the Island Tree District, the, unfortunately, the decision was not decisive. And so as a result, the court's lack of uniformity has really opened up the floodgates to the current trends of censorship. And so these attempts from school districts around the nation, this case really has emboldened them, especially the makeup of the court at this present time. And so to understand the PICO case, um, let's dig a little deeper into the facts Let's look at the court's reasoning. And unfortunately, the court's <laughs> lack of reasoning here or uniformity in their reasoning. And so in 1975, school board members from the Island Tree School District, they attended a politically um, conservative parent group conference. And so at the conference, these members were given a list of books that the parents found to be, and the, the language of the court uses this language, objectionable and improper fare for school students. So members of the school board reviewed the book collection. And so they took upon themselves to go to the libraries within their school districts and look for these books. And so they found 11 of the objectionable books on the shelves. Nine of these books were in the high school. One book was a part of the English curriculum. That was the book, The Fixer. And also there was a reader for writers was located in the junior high school library. And so uh, really what they targeted was primarily um, minority ideals, right? And so this is a list of the books. And so just to give you an idea of what they found to be objectionable. And so we have Soul on Ice by Eldrick Cleaver. And so according to, and these are taken out of context, so just so you know. Um, but there happens, according to this board, contains very graphic sexual, sexual scenes and references. Um, a Hero Ain't Nothing But a Sandwich by Alice Childress. There was a use of the F word, but also this book um, stated that our first president, George Washington, was a slaveholder. So some people felt that that was unpatriotic. Um, the Fixer by Bernard Malamud. Um, sexual scenes, bad languages, and use of the F word is what they stated. Go ask Alice, this anonymous writer here, um, inappropriate sexual reference in language. The Slaughterhouse Five by Kurt Vanagalt, Jr. 
sexual references and inappropriate languages, but also considered to be unpatriotic because this book discussed um, the problems with war. And the book, I believe, was published during the Vietnam War, even though it was about the World War II. Um, the Best Short Stories by Negro Writers is edited by Langston Hughes, again, cited for inappropriate language. Um, Black Boy by Richard Wright. Um, according to the board in this conference, people <laughs> discriminatory references to inappropriate language. Laughing Boy by Oliver Lafarge, again, inappropriate language. The Naked Ape by Desmond Morris, uh, references to human sexual activities. Number 10, A Reader for Writers, edited by Jerome Archer. And so really, when you look at the United States Supreme Court case, there really was no reason that was proposed for the exclusion of this book. And this was the only book that was actually found in the junior high school library. All the other books were found in the actual high school. And then number 11, Down These Mean Streets by P. Rowe Thomas. And again, they said there was graphic language and imagery. So I think this, this was a story about him rising up and living in difficult times to become a writer. So, um, so of course people got wind to this, but before I, I, I wanna stop here, there is a great podcast about this particular novel, um, this particular United States Supreme Court case, sorry. And so it's actually a podcast that features um, Stephen Pico, the lead plaintiff in this case, and so what I like about this particular um, podcast, because we don't have time here, it actually walks through some of the books and tells you in more detail why the board found these particular books to be objectionable. So if you want that particular link, let me know. I will make sure that uh, you get a copy of that. And so just again, it's just a way to see through this case through the actual plaintiff of this case. All right, so people took a wind of it, right? And so the board's reaction um, when they received, um, you know, media attention. So they released a statement to justify their actions. And so the board declared that the books were anti-American, anti-Christian, anti-Semitic, and just plain filthy, concluding that it is our duty, our moral obligation to protect the children in our schools from the moral danger as surely as from physical and medical danger. All right, so what they decided to do, the board appointed a book review committee, which consisted of eight members, four parents, and four members of school staff to read the books and give their recommendations to the board. And they were charged with looking at the books and deciding whether these books were on educational suitability, whether they fell under good taste, whether they were relevant um, and appropriate for the age and grade level. And so the committee did their work. Um, they had reached a decision. So five of these books, according to the committee, should be returned to the libraries. Two should be removed completely. One should be retained, but should require parental approval, approval to check out. And two, they were undecided about. However, the board rejected their recommendation altogether. And they only returned one book to the libraries and they keep and keeping a second one with the understanding it could be checked out only with parental approval. And so the other nine will remove completely as a result. All right, so um, on January 1977, five students led by Stephen Pico, who's pictured here, um, they sued the Island Trees Board of Education and the United States District Court for violating their First Amendment rights. The United States District Court found in favor of the school district um, and, and they, they held that the board had the authority to remove anything they found vulgar and bad taste, immoral or irrelevant. So the students at the time aged, were ages 13 to 17 um, at the time the books were removed. And so they appealed their case um, to the United States Court of Appeals and then they eventually reached the United States Supreme Court on March 2nd, 1982. So the Supreme Court announced its decision on June 25th, 1982. This was six years after the books were removed from the school. The lead plaintiff here, I believe, had entered college by the time this was decided. Okay. All right, so here is where the problem comes in and the concerns about the decision for, from the United States Supreme Court. Um, it was a five to four decision, so right there is a problem. It also was a plurality decision. 
And this one, we talk about plurality. A plurality is a decision in a case without really an opinion of the court. Uh, <laughs> it is just a statement by the court. Um, so a majority of the court's members agree on the result, i.e. four, um, five of the four, again, very close. And so when we talk about agreeing on the result, we're just talking about who won, right? But they did not agree on the reasoning, and that becomes problematic, okay? Because if you don't agree on the reasoning, it opens the door for other litigants to come in, okay? So again, they found in favor, Pico, and other students. Um, but unfortunately, there were also seven different opinions regarding this decision. So anyone can go and look at these opinions and take them apart, okay? So no majority opinion on the reason for that result. Um, and so what we have is pretty much a fractured opinion in this situation. All right, so let's look at the breakdown of the members that were on the court. And so even though through Brennan, the court held the following, and so this is just some quotes taken from this decision. Um, in a nutshell, it says, although uh, school boards have a vested interest in promoting respect for social, moral, and political community values, their discretionary power is secondary to the transcendent imperatives of the First Amendment. Also, as centers for voluntary inquiry and the dissemination of information and ideals, school libraries enjoy a special affinity with the rights of free people and press. Therefore, the board could not restrict the availability of books in the library simply because its members disagreed with their uh, ideal content. Check my time. However, though, Brennan's opinion further suggested that it would be permissible for school boards to remove books based on pervasive vulgarity or educational unsuitability. And so that is where the problem lies here. And so looking at some of the decisions from this court, we have concurring opinions and dissenting opinions here. So justices, Thurgood Marshall, they, John Paul Stevenson and Byron White concurred with the decision. Again, concurring with the decision only means that you agree with the outcome, but not the reasoning. Okay. Justice Harry Blackman concurred in part, so he didn't even agree all the way. <laughs> then you also have Chief Justice Warren Berger and Justice Lewis Powell and William Rehnquist and Sandra Day O'Connor dissenting. And they reject the rate of the students, um, I'm sorry, the right, the right of the students to have access to particular books. Um, Justice Rehnquist in his dissenting opinion says students do not have the right to access in school to anything beyond what their educators thinks is necessary. So even though PICO is, PICO is the first and only Supreme Court decision to address the student's right to receive information, it does not provide a clear explanation of the breadth of the school board's right to restrict access. So the fact that all nine of the Supreme Court justices have such a wide range of views did not contribute by any way to the clarity of this decision. All right, so we have interpretation problems here. So PICO has been interpreted to allow school boards some latitude in choosing um, to remove books. Um, there are two standards that were discussed in the justices' opinions which might allow for removal. Again, this whole idea of pervasive vulgarity or lack of educational suitability. So unfortunately, the problem is associated with interpreting these two stand standards. Um, and so also remember that these two standards were supported by four of the justices that actually made up the plurality opinion and the majority opinion of the court. All right, so school boards um, are responsible for supervising the education of students who are in their care and can remove materials. And so these are some of the results uh, of the case. And so these are the basic ideals. And so they can decide to remove things based on this educational unsuitability or this pervasively vulgarness. Okay? School boards cannot impede student rights just because they object to a certain viewpoint or ideal. But school boards must follow established procedures to remove materials from school libraries and classrooms. And so while there have been other cases about censorship, unfortunately, none of them have made it to the United States Supreme Court. So here are some noteworthy cases here. Okay? This is Monashini, I believe I'm saying it right, 
versus Strongville City School District. Now, this was a case decided in the United States Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit, so did not reach um, the United States Supreme Court. And so in this particular case, the book in question was Catch-22. Um, they said that it was profane and inappropriate language. Um, also, there was a reference in the book um, referring to women as whores. And so in the 1972 school district case, um, the board in Strongville, Ohio banned the book, but they did not state a particular reason why, okay? And so um, the library is a storehouse, according to the, the case here, of knowledge and students have the First Amendment right to receive information, and the librarian has the right to disseminate it. So this was a case that was actually decided six years before the Allen Trees case, and the, the students and family members were successful here. Another noteworthy um, case here um, in Counts versus Cedarville School District, um, case decided by United States District Court, the Western District of Arkansas, a federal district court in Arkansas invalidated the principal's plan, which was enacted at the school board's request to restrict access to J.K. Rollins' Harry Potter books after a person in the community objected that all the books taught witchcraft and the occult. Although the principal allowed the students access to the books with signed appropriate or permission, the district court in Arkansas found that this arrangement still violated the First Amendment right to the students. And finally, because I need to wrap up, in this last case, uh, Case versus United States, uh, I'm sorry, Case versus United District number 233. This is from the District of Kansas, um, United States District Court, a school board in Kansas removed Annie on my mind from the district's junior and high school libraries. If you don't know about this book, it's about, I think, two 17-year-old girls falling in love. And so in this decision, the district court referred to the PICO case when choosing to support the plaintiffs and having the book returned to the shelves. Um, in the discussion of the decision, the court cited several issues that the school board removed the book because they did not approve of its content and not because it was vulgar or educationally unsuitable. And the school board did not follow its own re reconsideration policy in its decision to remove the books. All right, so I'm gonna wrap up. Here are some websites that I used to do some research. And honestly, you all, this was new to me. This is a case that I've never really heard of. Like this United States Supreme Court case. I teach legal history. Why do I know about this? It's a really absurd case. And because it was so splintered that it was problematic. So here, if anyone wants the websites that I use um, and also any texts and actually the cases that I looked at, please let me know.